that can be derived from that knowledge base in the simplest possible manner. So I'm going to formalize that in a moment. But at the moment, by analogy and mathematical logic, think of it as like a deductive closure of a set of well-formed formula. Okay? And computing the rational closure means calculating its indicator function. So recall, for any set, the indicator function gives 1 if, an, an, in, if the input element is in the set, and 0 if it isn't. So the input elements here are the feasible conditionals. So you calculate the rational closure, and you query the knowledge base whether this feasible conditional is in the rational closure or not. So that's what we're calculating. So why would we want to do this? The Nixon diamond is a classical motivating example from the literature. So suppose you have a friend who believes in the following statements. Republicans are usually not pacifists, and Quakers are usually pacifists. And these are the only two relevant statements we care about. I mean, OK, you, there's probably background knowledge, but we don't care about that. So given these two statements, what other statements similar statements, should your friend rationally believe that would follow? So let's formalize this problem in propositional calculus. You have three propositional variables, P for pacifist, Q for Quaker, and R for Republican. And just now I said, OK, well, you have a defeasible conditional. You have this word usually. And I've had some debates now in the poster session about what that means. But one of the ways of formalizing usually is that you use a sort of normal world's uh, definition. So if, it, if in all of the possible worlds I can imagine, if theta is possible, then in the most normal such possible worlds, phi, if theta is possible in this world, then phi is possible. So what we do is we define another sort of snakes, but this time subscript s. So s is a sequence of sets of valuations. So s is s1, s2, s3, all the way to sk. And each of these SIs is a set of propositional valuation functions, or models. Okay? And you say that for any two well-formed formulae, theta and phi, but theta snakes S phi, if and only if, well, literally, this formal definition is a translation of what is here in English. So in the out of, there is some SI that makes non-empty intersection with this capital S theta. Capital S theta, don't worry about this notation for now, but it's the set of all valuation functions that render theta true, that assign 1 to theta. Um, and I write it in this funny notation because I think in terms of propositional atoms. So atoms are basically valuations. Okay, I'll call them atoms, but if you're still confused, ask me uh, afterwards. Um, okay, so if there is some set of worlds where theta is possible, then for the least such, so there's an ordering of by normality, that's interpreted as normality, in the least such world that has non empty intersection with S theta, it entails S phi. That's what it means. And there's a soundness and completeness theorem. Every single such sequence of sets of worlds defines uh, a snake, a non monotonic consequence version. So, and I said, okay, so we talk about what the feasible conditionals follow from our set. So, what does it mean for it to, to, to follow in the most conservative way? So, going back to our problem, so Republicans are usually not pacifists, Quakers are usually pacifists. Just collect them together into a set like this. And this is our conditional knowledge base. So the question is, what other things that most conservatively follows? And Lehman and Magadol, whose work I'm building on, in 1992 gives the answer, the rational closure. OK, I've said that before. But what does it mean? It means that we close K, our knowledge base, under a very special snake set. And this special snake set is what is called the most preferred consequence relation. It is the one that makes the least extravagant statements, unless you have information supporting these statements. And, uh, but this least extravagant, it is in some sense minimal. There's a very long-winded formal definition of what this means, so I can talk about it a bit if you want in the Q&A. It's also touched upon in my uh, extended abstract. But just think of it as like, the simplest things we can deduce without ex assuming anything more. So how do we compute the rational closure? Well, there is actually an algorithm to do this. Um, the input is a finite conditional knowledge base. And the output of the algorithm is the S that gives you the simplest one of these snakes S's. And then you just extend it to the indicator function by saying that, well, you can query the knowledge base with a theta snakes S phi. And then it would say yes if you satisfy the semantical definition and no otherwise. So the first step is you just 
put store your input somewhere, and this ATL just means all of your evaluation functions amongst your language of size L. So the language is, is finite, and evaluation, evaluation functions is just two to the size of L of those. And then for i from zero, you calculate the first set of valuations of this vector s. And this sort of funny intersection formula, it just tells you that you put in all the valuations in the most normal world, at the most normal level, that's consistent with the conditionals here. And eventually, you will reach the empty set, and then you stop, and then the s, the sequence of sets of valuations that is returned, gives you the most preferred consequence relation. Uh, otherwise, you just shave off the S's that have been already allocated and update your set of valuations. And you keep all the conditionals that have not yet been affirmed by the valuations. So how do we implement this? Quite directly. We implement it in C++ because it's a nice language and I'm most familiar with it. <laughs> so input a finite conditional knowledge base K. And what you do is k is basically a vector of the vector class. You scan through each the feasible conditional, which is also a class. You extract out the formulae, the antecedent and the consequent, which are also classes. And then you use a parser to parse them into disjunctive normal form. I'll explain why in a moment. But at the end of the class tree, you get the letters of the alphabet, and then you store them into an array. Um, the reference for that is the actual parsing library that we use. It's called Boost Spirit. Um, I don't know whether any of you are familiar, but they, 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 they have passing sort of procedures for any formal grammar you like. Um, to me, it's just a black box, and you input the grammar for propositional logic, and then it does the thing. So, in our example knowledge base, this passes into, it goes like, oh, we've got an R, so R is here. Oh, we've got a P, there's a P. Oh, we've got a Q. And then, oh, it goes C's a P again, oh no, we've already got a P. So we get this alphabet here. And the calculation, you just implement the steps quite directly, but there are some subtle issues. Um, we have to find a way to represent the formulae uh, efficiently with respect to the computer memory. Um, and then just generating these S's and then closing it uh, to get the conditional knowledge base and you can query it with conditional statements. So how do we represent valuations? So a valuation is just a function from your propositional alphabet to 0, 1. So if you consider listing your alphabet like this, evaluation is just 0 or 1 or 0, so it's just a binary string of length n. And therefore, valuation functions can be represented as an integer, a native type to C++, as an integer between 0 and 2 to the n minus 1. And this just speeds up the calculation. You don't have to deal with complicated classes and other types. So for our example again, our passing procedure allocates each alphabet to the appropriate bit position in memory. So it sees R first, so R gets the zero bit position, P gets the first, and Q gets the second. So that's how we store the integers in memory. So that was just the representation of valuations. So how do we represent formula? We parse into B and F because we know we can transform any formula into disjunctive normal form. And then in disjunctive normal form, what you have is you just have a vector, effectively, of um, conjunctive clauses, or I call here disjuncts. I don't know whether disjuncts is standard as a name. Um, and each disjunct is represented by two integers, a value and a max. So I'll just define them, and then hopefully you'll understand these by some examples. So the value basically says, I'm going to assign 1 to the appropriate bit position if in that position the propositional variable is present and not negated. Okay. And the mass just tells you which propositional variables are present in your disjunct or your conjunctive clause. So just to give some examples. So remember our previous allocation of these three letters is R is at 0, P is 1, and Q is at the second bit position. So if you see the letter R as a disjunct, it has value 0, 0, 1 because R is present and it's not negated. It's not not R, right? It's just R. So you have 1 in the 0 bit position, or here the least in the bit position. And then P and Q are not there, so you have 0 for the first. And then the mass is the same thing, because P and Q are not there, so 0 here, but then R is still there. So R gets mapped to 1, 1 as our representation. If you have P and not R, we know P is present and R is present. So in the mass, we have 1's in the 0 from the first bit position, so that's 3. But we know that R here is negative. So at the 0 bit position, it's 0. But P here 
It's one, because P is present and it's not negated. Okay? And Q is not present, so it's zero in the second bit position. So this is represented as two. And then similarly, R implies not Q, which you write as an OR. And then exactly the similar thing, but this time you have two disjuncts. So you have a pair of pairs of integers. Okay? So that's just a nice way of representing formula. So how do we find our S's? Uh, actually, no. We know how to find our S's. How do we find the valuations that evaluate your formula to true? Which is this set. So given any formula we want. And the rough answer, this is just a bit from our code. We loop through all two n of our valuations. And then for each valuation we loop through, we put it as an input to this method in the class. So a formula is satisfied by an integer value, which is precisely one of the valuations in that representation. And the key line is this. Satisfied, you just iterate. Um, you have an iterator here. And you iterate through the formula, which is already in the chunk of normal form. You scan every single disjunct. And for each disjunct, you say, well, do the propositional variables that are not negated present in the disjunct are also present in the atom? And this is what the AND does. The AND is just a bitwise AND. And you just compare it with the relevant, um, with the relevant uh, bit positions in the atom. And this is effectively a theorem prover. Through this result, we, can, we, we get the theorem prover for free by just looking for valuations and checking to see whether the ones in the antecedent are present in the constant. So maybe about a minute or so, I'll just quickly demonstrate the software and therefore answer the question I posed in the beginning, which is, if you have a conditional knowledge base, what, what, what happens? What can we deduce from the next environment? OK? So, oops. So just quit into here. So in, the, in our software, our conditional knowledge bases are, are text files. And you write your conditionals as follows. So this is R snakes, not P. Snakes is dollar sign. And then just separate them out with a comma. And then Q snakes P. So Quakers are usually pacifists. Republicans are usually not pacifists. And in the uh, software which you can run from the command terminal, so type the name of the file, that was nixon.txt. Uh, nixon so the first step here is we have a well-formed conditional knowledge base. The syntax is correct. This is how we've allocated the letters and the bit positions. And then the conditional knowledge base as read basically says, oh, this is what the user has written. And then this line here is passing it already in DNF, but we know this is a simple example, it's just the same thing. So we have three propositional variables so far. So suppose I ask the um, conditional knowledge base. I can ask something quite obvious. So are Republicans uh, usually pacifists? And the answer is no, because we've already assumed in our sets that Republicans are usually pacifists. Okay? So these intermediate steps there just gives you out all the S vectors, uh, all the S. Uh, the sequence of uh, sets of valuations. And then it just does this test afterwards. So here you've calculated S1 and S2, which are these valuations here. That gives you the most preferred constant integration. And then this, these last few lines just say, OK, let's take the input um, conditional, uh, divisible conditional, and then check to see whether semantically, in that long definition there in the most normal world satisfied thing, it's satisfied. And the answer is no. And of course, you can check this by hand, but it's tedious. That's why I wrote this. Thing. So you can also answer the question, or well, ask the question, sorry. <coughs> Given that we know that Republicans are usually not pacifists and Quakers are usually pacifists, can we say anything about Republican Quakers? Okay, so there's a potential for contradiction there with respect to the pacifism. So we can go uh, Republican and Quaker is a pacifist. Oops. Yeah, it's not. You can see here, this is the conclusion. So Quaker Republican, uh, the statement Quaker and Republican are usually pacifists is not in the rational closure. So we can't deduce this from the knowledge that we have. And similarly, you can say, are Republican Quakers usually not pacifists? And the answer is still no. What this example demonstrates is that this notion of most conservative entailment means that if you have a potential for contradiction, you will reserve judgment until you learn something new that resolves the contradiction. Okay? So that's just some of the intuition behind what that means. And uh, of course, you can quit the software. 
So I've only got one more slide left. Um, I don't know why it's black on the, on the left. So some future work. Um, this is still work in progress. I've not optimized the software, so maybe I can remove some extra loops and things like that. Um, maybe have a more user-friendly uh, user interface if, if that's forthcoming. Um, but really importantly, I want to tell all of you guys that I will make this code freely available to anyone who's interested in the feasible reasoning research. And um, the next PhD relevant piece of work of mine is something called extensive positive and negative knowledge. So my previous supervisor, Jeff Paris, he worked out in 1998 that if you have conditional knowledge bases that also have negative conditionals, so this basically says it is not the case that theta uh, defeats the entails phi, you can actually generalize the entire rational closure algorithm to this case. Um, but he told me he hasn't implemented anything, so probably it's up to me now with building on this stuff. Um, personal interest of mine, although it's, it's, it's probably beyond my PhD, is actually to use the software and conduct a psychology experiment. Because there are claims in the literature that the rational quotient is sort of the minimal, reasonable thing we can, we can say or we can entail. But the arguments they make there is just sort of intuitive, natural language, nice examples. So if you guys already have some doubts about my software calculations, like, oh, can we really say that about pacifist Republicans or, no, so Quaker Republicans? then yeah, such doubts are expected because we actually don't know whether humans reason this way as well. Although Lima and Magdal did make some speculations as well in their comment to this. So just to uh, finish off, the rational closure is of a conditional knowledge base are the conditional statements and included in the, in the set every other conditional statement that we expect to reasonably and so conservatively follow. And me and my supervisors have implemented this algorithm semantically, so we're manipulating valuations in C++. And there's still a lot of work to be done, so optimizations extending to negative knowledge and so on. And uh, we hope to make it freely available to the research community, and we look forward to any collaborations with psychologists on whether this is an accurate model for human reason. So thank you very much. So the, 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 the usual question you ask is, is Nixon a pacifist or not? So what would your system answer there? Also stay agnostic or? Anything that, if we assume more, we can prove more. So if, yeah. am, am I taking, am I correct in saying that, are, are, are you trying to match this with reality in some way? No, like, no. I, I just try to understand what your system is saying. Okay, okay, okay. Ask. So, yeah. So from, yeah. The, from the knowledge well, well, you have that Nixon is a pacifist, Nick, uh, sorry, Nixon is a Quaker, Nixon is a Republican, yeah, yeah. whether Nixon is a ah, okay, okay. pacifist. So, what, what I understand is, because Nixon is a specific instance of a Republican Quaker, mm -hmm. so, and the statements that we're dealing with make sort of a relatively general uh, statement about Republican Quakers. So, in terms of specializing to a particular instance, I don't know. Um, I suppose if you upgrade this, say, to first order logic, and then you may have some rules that manipulate conditionals in that way. But um, at the moment, at this level, and with my, from my demonstration, because Nixon is a Republican Quaker, and then all we know is that Republicans are usually not pacifists and Quakers are, we can't say anything. We reserve judgment. And Nixon is technically, with respect to our knowledge base, okay, it's a bit artificial, but with respect to that, we, can, we have to reserve judgment to avoid contradictions. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, one of the problems in uh, non-monotonic, uh, in the era of non-monotonic logic, is that there are so many different definitions of yes. what the feasible reasoning is. Uh, we have default logic, we have port epistemic logic, etc. How does your logic relate to uh, all these other logics? Can you use your approval to do uh, reasoning in auto epistemic logic, for example, or any of the other uh, okay. non-monotonic logic? Okay, so, so just to slightly repeat the question. So th there have been many, many different attempts at formalizing the feasible reason. And before the work of Lehman and Magdal in 1992, you have default logic by, um, was a writer? Um, Auto-epistemic logic and um, basically all these circumscription, all these other logics. And this particular logic builds on the premise that minimally, for a non-monotonic logic to make sense, it must satisfy some rules. 
And they made an argument in the original paper that all these other previous logics don't satisfy these rules. So with respect to this particular algorithm, whether we can translate this in some sense to these old, uh, older, I should say, older systems of logics, um, I'll say at the moment I don't know. The only thing I can say is this particular algorithm is specific to this logic. So if you, we want to translate this, we have to make a rough idea of, um, of, say for example, defeasible conditionals becoming default rules. But then default rules are more restricted because you can't really manipulate them in the way you can do there. So perhaps work semantically and not syntactically, I don't know at the moment. Oh, um, it seems to me that a lot of this work is done on the propositional level. Um, yeah. uh, that is very, very useful. But is, is there any other extensions to first order logic, etc.? I've already tried an extension to first order logic, and it sort of works. Um, I've not. I've just sort of done done it very, really analogously. Uh, this was my master's dissertation, oh, okay. um, and the theorems are there, but I've not. What's missing, and this is something I need to do, is to put it in context. Because Lima and Magdalene actually also tried extending to first order logic, but they stopped short at doing the rational closure. But I think my attempts can, in some sense, accommodate the rational closure as well. But um, also for something relevant to Renazi's field, is that I'm still interested in doing this for modal logic as well. Um, but then I don't, I don't know the semantics might be slightly weird. But... Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next, we have a um, presentation of work by Alexander Polotov and uh, Vasily Shangi on uh, proof search for natural reduction in the setting of paracomplete logic PCOM. I'm going to talk about this uh, work um, on natural deduction uh, construction for different types of logic. This is a joint work uh, between the University of Westminster and Moscow State University. Is this guy should work? It's a first half. It's a first half. It's a first half. Right. Um, so there are various things uh, which would be considered as as, as reasons for such work. Uh, well, first of all, we came interested in natural deduction as a specific type of thinking, uh, and this is what people normally consider when they consider natural deduction in classical setting. But I think uh, this setup disappears as soon as we go beyond classical logic. So, so, so in, in a sense, it's a matter of sort of taking the advantages of this proof technique which we developed for classical setting and see whether we can make, make it useful in other, in other frameworks. So this is what, this is what uh, we've done and I'll, I'll give you a little history of the approach. Uh, so I, I hope m most of you are familiar with natural deduction, but just to give you a gist of the system. So any proof in this, in this framework starts with making assumptions, or you, you may be given some some type of knowledge base we should consider assumptions. And then, and then you construct the proof using some, some rules to eliminate operations or, or introduce operations. And uh, uh, partly I'm interested now in, in applying all, this, all these developments to the specification of systems. So, so, so we, can, we, can, we can 
possibly go along the standard framework, given the specification built on, build, build, build some proof in order to check whether some duplicated properties are happening or not. Uh, why am I going that way? Just up. Just up. Right. So, uh, as I said, we have some history of developments in this in this setting. Uh, uh, after after doing plenty of background research for classical propositional and, and first order logic, we jump to the temporal logic, linear time, branching time, uh, tackled tackled non-classical reasoning in form of paraconsistent logic. Paraconsistent the logic where where you can't derive anything from the contradiction, right? So now this time this time we are talking about the dual system where where you have if you have a contradiction you can derive anything from it but the law of the middle in general is not working. So it's not a very it's not a very formula in general. Uh, now of course the, the whole purpose of this exercise is not just to give the construction of the system. The purpose is to give the proof search technique and to see whether whether we can actually make some sense out of out of this Searching. All right. So, what is part complete setup? Well, apparently, it's it's the it's the is the framework of non-classical logic introduced by Avram, and uh, the point is that you can't derive in general, right, the, the true as a consequence of of any formula. Um, so, coming back to this point of specification, I found this uh, quite quite a strong argument. You can argue about it, but I think. Very often, especially in nowadays applications, you've got you've got plenty of heterogeneous environments, and very often you've got incomplete information. So, so really, what this setup gives you is probably just an approach how you can apply reasoning in in the in the setting of incomplete information. So you don't have enough knowledge, right? So you don't have enough knowledge whether some property is there or not. So don't don't just don't just be so rigorous about it. something about incomplete system specification, right? Now, the axiomatic system is given here is a subset of classical logic, as you can see. There's one rule of inference mode exponents, and it's a type in the proceedings for the last axiom, actually. So it should be like this. Uh, so if you ever go back to the, to the end of the proceedings, so please, please excuse us for this absolutely idiotic type of machine. Well, nevertheless, that's the axiomatics, uh, which is not ours, of course. It's due to... Uh, 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 it's, it's the logic with three values, semantics, so you've got uh, one f and zero with a dedicated design, designated value one, and the matrices are here, and if you, if you have a look at the way how matrices work, you would see, you would see that p or not p is not a valid formula, so, so it, would <coughs> fail, it would fail with this third value f. Now, because of this feature, there are plenty of, plenty of syntactic, syntactic uh, issues in the logic where, for example, you, you don't have all, all different positions if you want, right? So, so you, you can't really manipulate easily with the expressions. And uh, that gives you... So, uh, as I said, the initial deduction system is such that you've got two types of rules to apply. Now, you start your proof with assumptions, so you try to decompose formulae, and then you build up, build up the, the things that you set up as goals. So, we will see later on that the whole searching procedure is 100% goal-directed, so any step in the, in, the, in, the, in the technique is dedicated to derive some goal. Now, the relational rules are quite simple, as you can see. Uh, they, most of them are quite, quite, actually all of them are classical rules, right? So there's nothing, nothing to it here. Uh, remember, that, remember that some classical features are not happening here. For example, you can't derive, in general, from A implies B, you can't derive not A or B. That's not happening. Otherwise, you will, you will, you will be able to derive more things that are not needed. Now, You've got, you've got the rule which we call disjunction elimination in the, in the right bottom uh, corner. And that is the reasoning by cases, as you can see, right? So you've got, you've got disjunction A or B. If you assume A 
a or b the square brackets would mean that you introduce them as assumptions so if you do if you do all of that you can derive c and square brackets would mean that you have to discharge assumptions and that's the way how that type of nomination deduction works so when you introduce assumptions then some rules would allow you to discharge them from the proof so you can't use them any longer now introduction rules are such that you use them and uh, try to, to, to assemble something clever. And of course, if you go into the history of, 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 of natural deduction, you will see that plenty of criticism, even by very, very big and famous people, was due to this introduction. So for example, take this junction introduction. So why on earth you would, you would know what to introduce if you know A, right? What is B? So of course, of course, of course, you have to, you have to, you have to be very careful to stop, to stop this random, random generation of different things. But things are even more difficult in terms of avoiding loops, of course. So when you, when, when we worked on the algorithm here, you've got plenty of, plenty of dedicated techniques which would prevent looping when you've got disjunctive goals. And this is the feature of the system. It's very difficult to work with disjunctive goals in general. So the rules are here, so you can you can you can you can see them. Again, the square the square bracket would mean that you introduce an assumption, say the rule uh, this one, yeah, introduction of implication tells you that if you got if you if you derive B from the assumption C and you can discharge C and you end up with the with the implication C implies B. Well similarly this rule just just corresponds to the how should I pronounce it? Paris. Paris law. Right, thanks. Uh, um, well, this is the system. You need something else. And this is the, this is the one which corresponds to the, to the property of the system. That you, can introduce, you can derive anything from the contradiction. Then we define the standard concept of, of inference and the proof. So that means that you have to end up with a sequence of formula where every formula is either an assumption or derived from the previous by rules of inference. And you follow the, this approach of discharging formula from the proof. And uh, if you manage to prove something without, without sort of non-discharged assumptions, meaning that the set of these assumptions is is, is empty, really, right? Then you've got, you've got, you've got something as a theory. So this is set up. Now I'll give you an example of, of the proof. Very simple proof, of course. It should be simple because we've got straightforward correspondence of the first law, which, which now is represented in, in the rule. So you get an assumption. The first formula, P implies P implies P, obvious assumption. I don't have any, any strategy here, right? I'm just using using intuition if you want and, and my knowledge how to do it of course so it's very simple proof then i'll give you the idea how the algorithm of the searching procedure is approached and then you will see how that proof is changing to become an automated proof now so that's, that's very straightforward so you've got you've got two assumptions from one and two you derive p by elimination of implication then by this rule which corresponds to the Peirce law you just you just repeat p again and then and then you're done eliminating two assumptions so you derive formula 5 which is the Peirce formula and your set of assumptions is empty now so you discharge you discharge two form formula and then and then you're done now all this is fine of course uh, so the searching procedure is goal directed uh, therefore, uh, the, main, the main idea now is to define, define steps of the searching technique in a way that, in a way that any time you target a specific goal, we call it the current goal, of course, and, uh, and uh, you have to, you have to sort of trace your proof any time, any step, at any step of your, of your work to check whether you reach the current goal. And of course, it's, is the way is the way how the concept is defined. So you either have to find gra identically graphically identical formula in the proof, or if if your current goal is related to the assumption, then you have to follow all this all the syntactical uh, definitions of the of the assumptions. Uh, and you can have finally the goal is a contradiction. Therefore, you have you have reached a contradiction as a goal if you've got two formula in the proof that contradict each other. So that's the way how you check whether your current goal is achieved or not. 
And now I'm, I wouldn't go straight forward this would algorithm because it, it would be quite difficult, of course. I'm trying to give you the hint uh, how to understand the searching procedures. So what are the searching procedures? First, the first one is looking for applicable elimination rules. Definitely so you've got some, some material to decompose, so you look, you look, you look forward, of course, because they simplify the steps. Now, so it's like a filter, so whatever, whenever you can apply elimination rule, do it. So that's the rule. Now, the next procedure takes the structure of the, of the current goal, and depending on the structure, it fires corresponding routine, if you want. So, so, so we have different cases, but you can, you can see here what's happening. Take the first one, for example. It says, if your goal is A and B, it's just like designated current goal, then you have to, to derive both conjunctions. So it's quite not, not obvious, it's natural. Now, more complicated cases are given here in this 2171 two, and 2172, two, and this is very dedicated to the system. So, so let's, let's have a look what's happening here. Now, your, your task is to derive some formula f of a very specific type. So anytime you have to know what is the type of the goal you target. Now, if your formula is a ritual or a disjunction, then you apply, you apply that, that, that procedure to the formula, and then what you do, you try, you're trying to derive a contradiction from that formula, F, right? And, and if you've done that, that's the intuition behind it. Then, of course, you can, you can derive anything, including, including the formula you want. So remember the rule which allows you to derive anything from the contradiction is B and not B implies anything, right? So now, by that anything, I would mean exactly what is re re required by the structure of this, of this goal. Right. Um, now, the next procedure, three, uh, is actually the checking whether the current goal is reached or not. So that's quite obvious. If it's reached, you, you just go, go to the previous goal, and that would determine the introduction rule to be applied, if you want. Now, if it's not reached, then you go to, to the different techniques, depending on what's happening in the proof of So the next procedure is, 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 is finding a relevant introduction rule. So that is related to the previous one. So if the goal is reached, you just jump to the previous goal and see how that link would, would force you to derive a specific goal. Now, <clears throat> the one thing I haven't described yet is a very dedicated technique of dealing with the, with the um, state of the proof when we are stuck, if you want, right? So that's one of the important features of this technique which we are sort of taking from one logic to another. And this one, one of the, one of the I think, nice features of this approach. So in general, we, we have the same, the same strategy, if you want, as a classical setting, temporal setting, model setting, and, and here. So what's happening? Imagine you, you try to build the proof. At some, at some stage, you, you ex explore all possible elimination rules, so nothing can be done there. You've got, you've got some, some goals in your stack of goals, so you, you, your goal has not been reached. So what to do? You start, right? When you start, what, we, what we're trying to do, we're trying to look back to the list of formulae in the proof, and the structure of this formula in the proof, if they are not atomic formulae, not literals, would determine next steps, if you want, right? So, for example, if you've got, if you've got a negation of the formula in the proof, you would, you, would, you would try to reach the formula under the negation, right? If you've got an implicative formula, A implies B in the proof, you would try to, you would try to reach the antecedent of the formula, A, right? Because if you reach it, you will be able to apply more response in the future, and so on. So, this is the sugar now. The algorithm is sketched here. So you initialize, set, depending on what is given to you as a setup, you check the issue of the current goal because it will be straightforward, and then you go through through this through these routines of applying elimination rules. If you're successful, go to the current goal analysis. If you're unsuccessful, see what see what else you can do. If you start, go back to the list of the formula in the proof. Try to get new sources for the goals and go and go. Right. You terminate if your current goal is reached and, and the current goal is the main goal. And if you haven't reached it, you will have a current model. So it would be like a decision procedure for this. Now, uh, I miss all this stuff, of course. Now, this is the same person law, and this is the algorithmic proof. 
So you can see it's very different from what we've got before. Rather than having five steps, we've got all this stuff. Why? I think it's our payoff. Right? What we want our system to do is to be able to decide things, right? So, so when, when, when difficult formulae are now quite nicely approached, simple formulae became quite difficult in terms of the, in terms of the flow. But anyway, yes, that's the deal. So there's not, nothing we can do about it, right? There's no, I, I can't see any refinement here, but it's not as bad as this. So the, the difference would be, of course, in, in, the, in the application of those, you will see straight away. I've got first formula, P plus Q plus P, antecedent of the first law. I'm targeting to derive P, right? That's my first goal. And I'm stuck immediately, right? Because P is an atomic formula. I can't apply any searching strategy here. I can't apply any elimination rule there. So I'm diving to the procedures I described, where you've got literal as a goal. So what you're trying to do now, you're trying to derive introduction from that goal and apply more steps. And I, I don't have time now, of course, to go through the, all the steps, but that's the, that's the cause for that proof to expand to that level, as you can see at the time. Uh, if you, if you, I have to run after this talk, and I'm finishing now, right? I've, I've got a poster which we set up next to the, next to the coffee table, so it would be without me, but please, 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 please contact me if you've got any doubts about the system and any any questions and so on and so So yeah, I would have an example of, of, of that proof which is, which is dealing with little knowledge base of that type. When, when you would have a problem if you think about that, that setup in the classical framework and you don't have any inconsistency with these conditions if you've got the, this setup with the different information. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're running slightly late, but perhaps there's a question. Perhaps for clarification, we had in the previous example that you had there something like A and B, and then you said that gives us sub goals A, B separately, mm -hmm. but you still have the A and B as a goal there. Yeah, because we don't we don't eliminate the goal. Once you 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 don't uh, f from 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 from. Having, having a formula, a conjunctive formula in the, in the stack of goals, I don't delete it from the stack of goals, right? Because once I, I achieve both conjuncts, I'm coming back to the previous goal. That will, that will tell me, right. apply introduction rule. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you have a constructive completeness proof in the sense that for every formula, either there is a proof or there is a countermark? I hope I can. Yes, it's quite, it's, 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 it's quite involved, and, and, and the, the, the idea of the proof is to build a hinting concept showing, showing, that, sh showing that if you, if you have an exhaustive search, as, as it is here, right, and this searching procedure going to the compound form in the proof actually builds that hinting concept, if you want, right? Then, then it shows if you don't have a proof, then you've got an and, and, and then what, and then it, right? it actually gives you a... Yes, a counter model. Counter model. Okay, uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. the session chair for this session and uh, the first talk is by Ryan. Okay, so without further ado, Ryan. Hi, yeah, so I'm Ryan. Um, I've actually been here a few times before. So I've come here for my fourth time and complete the set. Um, I'm uh, finishing a PhD at University of Glasgow uh, with Alice Miller and Mr. Robertson. And uh, this talk I'm going to talk a bit about uh, formal proof and abstraction for agent-based learning systems. Um, so it's a little bit of a wordy title, but uh, we use the term agent-based learning system because it gives us quite broad scope for the systems we deal with. Specifically, I'm going to be talking about today uh, biologically-inspired robots. So, got one here. Um, 
So this is the agent in our system, the robot. It has two sets of antenna pairs. Um, it has red, red antenna, which are very close to the robot, and they act as kind of like pain sensors for the robot. It has longer blue antenna, which are its, it's distal antenna, which it doesn't initially know how to use, but eventually learns to use to try and avoid colliding with obstacles. So it also has motors for running forwards and for turning. Um, so I imagine they didn't learn. So it's, 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 it's in an environment where it is trying to avoid colliding with obstacles. And it has a rudimentary form of learning called ICO learning, which is input correlation learning. Uh, the idea of this learning is it correlates a signal from its uh, long range antennas, which it doesn't know how to interpret straight away, with a pain signal from its close range antenna. And by correlating these with either a positive or negative correlation, it will learn to turn to avoid obstacles before colliding and experiencing a pain signal. So these are the type of systems we're, we're dealing with. And the goal is to apply model checking to these. Uh, particularly what I'm working with is like uh, model checking spin and the modeling language problem. So I don't think model checking has been explained extensively so far, so just a, a general overview. So like, when you model a system, you break it into a state space, a series of states and transitions, and you then define a property you want to uh, assert about the system in a logical language, and you test that over a state space to verify whether it's true or false. So, so the initial models we did, uh, I call them explicit models, because these are highly detailed models of the system, very akin to simulations. Um, this is kind of one of the more basic examples where we have, from right to left, uh, three different states with two transitions, and we have a robot approaching an obstacle, sensing an obstacle, and then turning to change its direct trajectory to avoid it. So uh, all the positions and coordinates of the obstacles and the robot are stored within this state space. And we can verify properties such as will the agent eventually avoid colliding with obstacles? Uh, which is quite useful for the electronics department when we're building these systems. But what we find is as we scale these systems up, so we increase the size of the environment, or the amount of obstacles in this environment, we tend to get the kind of state space explosion problem that we're familiar with, and uh, the state space becomes intractable, and we can't then verify the same properties. So what we came up with was an abstraction of this. So this is probably the best way to visualize the abstraction. So it's basically, I call it the relative model, because it's a, a view of the environment relative to the robot, a kind of agent-centric agent view. And so visualize that's this code projecting from the, the robot. I've got some units up here expressing some of the uh, specifications. Um, so this code isn't arbitrary. It's formally defined based on the specification of the robot, its antenna lengths, the angle between them, etc. Also the damages of the obstacles. Uh, but uh, more importantly, it's also defined by what we've termed the complexity of the environment. So we define the complexity of the environment as the minimum distance between any two obstacles within an environment. Okay, and so the higher the complexity, the closer obstacles can potentially be together, making it a harder system for the robot to navigate in. And by taking all these parameters on board, we can define the area of the code, which is like the area in which the robot can interact with things. And we can abstract it this way because we're not really concerned with uh, where the agent is in a particular environment, but we are concerned with how it learns and how it responds to obstacles. So what we have is, for in order this, for this abstraction to represent uh, all these various explicit environments, what we need to do is we need to have a, a non a, uh, some non-deterministic decisions in how obstacles enter this cone here. So we have obstacles entering the perimeter of the cone as a non-deterministic choice of where it can arrive. And we deal with all possible situations, so all different angles which the obstacle can approach into this cone, given the specification of the robot and the environment. And so these are non-deterministic um, uh, <laughs> decisions allow us to deal with all possible scenarios for the uh, defined this environment. So this uh, abstraction allows us to verify the same properties we had before, but now we are dealing with like potentially infinite explicit environments under the certain complexity class of environment, and we're dealing with all sorts of different explicit environments. So we're actually piecing over a much broader uh, spectrum of environments. So once we have this, although this is quite intuitively a representation of those environments, we need to show uh, a formal, uh, formal relationship between the explicit model and this abstraction, the relative model. And so I didn't want to show a simulation relation, touched on before. But uh, so 
but this is a full simulation relation in that if we have a property which we should be true in our relative model, then we want to say this is also then true for all our explicit models as well by, by, by this simulation relation. So I'm just I'm going to illustrate the proof because it's, it's a lot more intuitive this way. So on the right here we have the explicit model and on the left we have the relative model, so the abstraction. Uh, and this, uh, this is basically a function mapping and we're just dealing with all the deterministic transitions within the system for this part of the proof. So what we have is we have the state um, S E of N, which is just the state in the explicit model, and that transitions through its function F E to the subsequent state S E of N plus 1. Likewise, in the relative model, we have the state uh, SRN, which transitions through FR to the state SRN plus 1. Okay. And so, in order to make our proof simpler, what we did is we defined functions T1 and T2. And what these allowed us to do is actually define the function, the transition function FE, in terms of FR. And so, in our simulation relation, we have to show the, the two initial states. And so, these two states match, so we need to show the SN, SEN and SER are mapped together, but not only that, we have to show that the transition and subsequent states are also within the simulation relation. So by defining functions T1 and T2 uh, in such a way, we use them to, uh, sorry, we're defining function FE to incorporate functions T1 and T2, we pass through T1 and actually pass through the transition in the relative model, and then back using T2 to get the subsequent state in the explicit model, Using FE. So we actually go through transition in the relative model via a transition in the explicit model. So we create, we infer that we have to be in the successor state in the relative model to map back to the successor state in the explicit model. Um, so by finding this way, we imply the simulation for deterministic transitions. So the next part I mentioned the non-deterministic situations. So when obstacles approach uh, the relative model, and non-deterministically deciding whether to which point in the code to come in. Um, we, we call a state where these non-deterministic transitions take place as a free space state, so SR0. So when the robot is in free space, i.e. in the cone, there are no obstacles present, and it can transition either to another state where there are still no obstacles in the cone, or it can transition into a state where an obstacle comes into the cone and uh, non-deterministically chosen. So in order to complete the simulation relation, we need to show that all the states in the explicit model which map to this free state space, all their successor states are mapped by the non-deterministic choices. So we have once again the explicit model on the right, and we have the relative model on the left. Uh, on the left you see uh, arrows coming from state SR0, uh, the SRN states are uh, situations where an obstacle is coming to the code, and the arrow looking back to itself is when it's continuing to be in free space. Um, what we did is we actually defined the non-deterministic choice to put in obstacles of SR0 to encompass all possible um, situations for an obstacle to arrive in the code. And by doing so, we then uh, infer that we actually have considered all possible successor states uh, in the explicit model as well. Um, so what we ended up showing in the work is we ended up showing that there are uh, our relative model, our abstraction, simulates our explicit model. But more than that, we infer that our uh, relative model actually simulates all permutations of, of the explicit model, provided they fit into the complexity class of environment. And uh, once again, having a simulation relation allows us to say, if we have a, for example, LTL formula, phi, which is true in our relative model, then it is also true for all our explicit models as well. Um, so, so if I, but like, the future work is um, uh, to increase the script of the relative model. So in the thesis, suspect that in lots of different scenarios where we add in different robots into this cone as like treated as dynamic obstacles uh, and uh, various other configurations of obstacles. Uh, so the script is scale up this style of abstraction. Uh, and I have a lot of uh, functions for generating the cone, the generating environments, and it'd be nice to have some sort of automated way of giving system parameters to generate uh, models and then also abstractions thereof models. Uh, so yeah, that's just about it. So thank you very much. Okay, I'll start with.
the audience here. Any questions? Yeah, with your first diagram, you have, you have the extra link from your concrete to the abstract model. Yeah. Also, that what was it called? KN. Yes, oh, sorry, yeah, I meant to mention that. Yeah, so um, KN is basically uh, some key information stored from the, the uh, explicit state, which allows us to translate back via T2. T, T. Yeah, that was my, in a sense, yeah. my, my question. So when you abstract and then you lose some information, yeah. and so you would not be able to get back completely from the abstracted information, typically, with T2. And I assume the KN is to get that extra information that is needed. Well, KN can that. be, uh, so from the abstraction, we obviously lose information and apply the nature of the abstraction. But um, uh, we can derive all the information we need from, uh, from uh, the explicit state to get that transition back here. Um, so from the state SC, we can actually, all, we have all the information there to map to all those transitions back to SC1. To this can is just to show that we need that information in the T2 translation. So we're actually going from state uh, SEN to SEN plus one. We have all the information we need there, but we go via these functions to get there as, so that we imply that we actually have to go through the rel transition of the relative model. Thus, ensuring our, our simulation. Okay, and it's also then uh, since, since that I, with your, in your next picture you didn't have these extra links, so that was without the the transition via K and. Yeah. So um, because we are mapping to an individual state in this diagram, so we're mapping to the individual state of free space, then we already know uh, all the information we need. Uh, from the explicit model there, uh, and this is a more a general statement in saying that like, we have shown that all non-deterministic transitions are all possible situations where an object can enter the code, and hence it's all possible transitions are represented also in the explicit model. Um, might be clearer on the poster uh, if I show you diagrammatically what I'm, what I'm saying. That's always the problem with these. <laughs> So you refer to a non-deterministic case, as a case where nothing appears within this code. So what happens if something shows up in this code? Is it always uh, a deterministic case? I mean, are the moves of the robot always fully determined? Uh, so in, in this particular model I'm talking about, yes, uh, the moves are fully deterministic once the obstacle is entered into the code. But there is scope for having one determinism in the way the robot acts or probabilistic behavior in, right. using different model checkers, etc. Um, I have a I have a question. So how how do you represent the um, so the explicit model itself? So how is it represented? Is like does it actually um, represent the exact you know what's going on? Like where the um, the obstacles are and stuff like that? Yeah. So it doesn't in a a kind of more hybrid model pro approach. So instead you you can have a kind of C programs running in the background which don't contribute to the state space. So you have C functions which will, I can use to do the geometric calculations. So I only need to store like uh, individual points of obstacles and robots, and then I can do the calculations, changing the state space, but the state space may remain reduced because I don't have to have all the calculation information. What, no, what about the obstacles? Are they, are so they the like obstacles, explicitly are explicit coordinates. Uh, coordinates. Yeah. 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 Okay, but like in the, um, uh, in the relative model, they uh, non-deterministically appear instead. Mm. So there's still coordinates in the relative model, but in a much smaller uh, space. And in fact, we just deal with a, uh, we don't actually map the whole space of the code. Yep. We just map the the row relative to the obstacle. So we only yep. have like, basically two objects, and we don't have these for that. How how big the reduction is? Um, uh, I don't have the figures with me, but recently I uh, just got a paper published in a journal of computation, and we actually have a comparison uh, with our uh, explicit models and our, our relative model. Um, the reduction. Uh, okay, the reduction isn't that big there, but that's because my the, the relative model is actually dealing with all possible explicit environments. Whilst we're comparing like a specific environment, verify the property. Whilst the uh, abstract model is actually dealing with all possible environments, but the state space is slightly reduced even for an individual environment. Okay. So, so it's actually a huge reduction when you consider the scope of what the abstract uh, right. model is actually covering. And how, um, well, how precise an abstraction is this? 
Um, so, I mean, the simulation relation holds, which, which is yep. great, so we know the properties hold. Um, in terms of accuracy, so when you deal with a real physical system, obviously there are error margins, uh, and uh, this allows you to, to create simulations, and uh, obviously a simulation itself is an abstraction, and our model is, <coughs> is an abstraction, but we try to make our explicit model as close. In fact, our explicit model is exactly the same as the simulation that we got from uh, some of uh, closing electronics. Um, uh, it was produced by Bernard Fors uh, on my abstract in the references, but we got their simulation data and basically built our model as accurately as their simulation. So, but what about the, the precision of the uh, relative model in terms of the explicit model? Okay, so it's, like, it's yeah. as precise in terms of the angular calculations mm -hmm. or the distance calculations. Right, okay. um, so it preserves that accuracy, but it's dealing with a much smaller area, so you can do this. Uh, I see, okay. All right. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Second talk is uh, Mohammed. Well, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mohammed Azharani. I'm a PhD student at Heratwak University. Uh, today, I'm going to present uh, my research is about uh, model checking uh, sensitive uh, time sensitive work applications. We are using the model checker Sven and Yobal. Uh, unexpected uh, user request. So, 
these are the wonderful properties that we uh, we focus on. Uh, time constraints in, uh, is important to control the user behavior, especially in like an online banking web application. And this is uh, the short deferment cycle uh, can uh, can produce uh, unexpected security issues. So the properties that we worked on was first the security properties. We we uh, modeled the authentication uh, by first we talked about adding a security protocol at the, at the start of the model. Then in the authentication properties we we modeled the uh, the pages and the page transactions. This will be discussed in our model. And the session management properties we add some timeouts during the run and we ensure that the same user ID is kept during the session, one session. Uh, a definition of model checking, uh, uh, I'm sure that most of you know the model checking, but uh, uh, having a fine set model of system and the property, the model checker just checks whether the property holds for a given initial state in the model. Why did we choose model checking? Well, uh, it's, uh, first, the ch uh, checking process is automatic. Uh, it's faster than traditional application techniques like uh, testing. Uh, at the end, we got a counterexample that just shows the uh, property is not satisfied. Uh, our first tool, we used the model checker spin. Uh, 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 the current version of SPIN uh, does not uh, support the concept of timing, so uh, we added uh, the timing, uh, timing macros at the beginning of our code to give us a uh, discrete timing during the run of the model. Uh, basically, SPIN was developed for the verification of distributed uh, software system. Uh, it uses the, the formula framework language. Uh, it models the system as uh, uh, a process that communicates either, either with each other via uh, channels and uh, shared circles. Uh, in our model, uh, modeling time is uh, uh, critical to design realistic models of web applications. Uh, time is used in scenarios like uh, to give timeouts in the case of uh, an activity for a, a period of time, and also uh, to timestamp between communication parties. Uh, the use of discrete time is, we discussed that uh, it can reduce the risk of the state uh, space explosion. Uh, real time uh, could result in uh, an increase of the system space to um, an tractable uh, level. Uh, the role of discrete time in our model is to identify the sequence of actions in one session. So when we add an attacker, we can know if the sequence of actions is different from a secure one. Uh, we extended our code with uh, uh, discrete time macros. So in our uh, uh, sample model, we have uh, uh, two variant uh, set of automata. We have the page automaton that uh, represent uh, the pages and the pages transactions. So it's like the page is like a state and state transaction at the end. And the internal state automata uh, present the business logics that uh, uh, that. Um, describe the input of variables and, uh, and uh, in, in, in any uh, work application. So this is an example of an online banking. Uh, the client will try just to make a payment uh, and it will be rejected by the by the type of uh, by the amount of money that he has and also by the timing. Uh, when we run the, uh, the sequence chart by spin, uh, it shows us uh, 
the, tra uh, the, trans uh, the communication between the client and server. So as you can see, we have uh, a client, a channel, then uh, the server, then another channel that will, will send back to the client. This one was the, the secure model. Uh, this is like, uh, as I said, uh, the modeling of security properties. Uh, uh, session management is uh, is modeled via checking that the user ID is the same during uh, the same uh, the one session. And we we in one hour we give a timeout and we verify that uh, it is uh, checked uh, during the verification part. Uh, in the verification properties, we we check that, uh, for example, these are examples from what we are, uh, we are verifying, is the home page is reachable from all pages. And a user can log out at any stage of the transition. Also, a page uh, is reachable from the home page or our account page always has the, the next page in transition. And we say that uh, a user cannot reach his account page without going through the login page, uh, not bypass the login page. These are the discrete time models that we use in our, uh, in our uh, model. So basically we find a timer. Uh, we set the timing and there is an expire during one, the session. Uh, the worst type timer is the uh, the control of is the block of our model. The second uh, tool that we use model is Oval. Oval is uh, uh, use uh, graphical design to uh, to design our models. It's uh, different from uh, from uh, uh, It's time it use real time modeling. And it uh, models as uh, a network of time automata uh, with real clocks and uh, data variables. Uh, we uh, we created uh, in Oval uh, three tables: uh, the, the user, the server, and also the timer that uh, controls the session between the parties. We will show one example. This is the user table. The locations here are the pages, and uh, the user is communicating with the with the server here by sending a log log out, uh, request, login request through the channel login. Then uh, it's uh, changed the shared variable sent uh, to to positive. Then we in the server side we check the session uh, uh, throughout. Uh, a comparison between the two tools. Uh, first, uh, since Oval uh, is uh, more graphic in design, it's easier for us to to build the uh, to build the model. And uh, in contrast to to spin that really needs uh, more careful uh, writing of the specifications. Though, in when we want to uh, to run the model, it's easier to spin uh, by using uh, the simulation charts that uh, show us that our model is correct from the beginning. While in, in, in Oval, we need to have uh, uh, a, a final uh, product before we can run it. Uh, either uh, in, the, in the compromise model, when we add the attackers, it was easier to to find the different sequence of actions in with spin, uh, and while in in Oval we had to also to uh, to go back and check uh, the sequence of actions uh, after the verification part to find that uh, if there is um, an attacker or having been doing the session or not. Uh, thanks a lot for listening. Uh, any questions? Thank you.
is, is your work motivated by modeling web pages, or is it that they are linked to your model in some sense, in a way? So, so how do you know that you model the right aspects? And, uh, well, it's, um, it's, 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 yes, it's, uh, it's related to modeling web applications. I said it modeling web applications, and then we start using Spin and Uber to find the, the perfect tool, or at least to, to study different types of modeling web applications. Well, I assume you have a model there, which you check then with the with spin or whatever kind of tool. So how do you know that this model corresponds to the actual web application? Uh, now we only just start with using samples of application. Now we, we try to move to real web application, web, web, real designs, and when then we try them. Right. Okay. Actually, I have a question related to my first, my first question. So usually web applications are given like you know, in like PHP and JavaScript, things mm -hmm. like that, right? Which is quite complex, and um, mm -hmm. somehow you have to build on top of that some kind of abstraction, you know? And like you know, if you have to, you have to abstract in order to get, um, I don't know, I guess if you use you file, then you get uh, time parameter or something like that. There has to be some kind of abstractions, which is usually not. I am, as far as I understand, it's not really, you know, not that trivial. So you, you know. Um, have you thought about you know what kind of abstractions you you're gonna use well, like if you wanna apply to you know real web well, applications? Well, I think we are like yes. uh, we are modern and very abstract models for application. We we didn't go to the code and after that, but we just started with studying the the difference in in cases of if there's an attack, if the time gonna be different. Okay, a sequence of actions. We are trying to to model. Uh, simple property, like saying the, um, the navigation properties between pages. So these are like, these are uh, the levels we were working at. We didn't go to more than So I mean, uh, did you look, uh, did you have any, um, did you do some kind of experiment as well? Or? Uh, yes, we are working on that now, yeah. Uh, and from which, uh, like, you know, what kind of, what kind of data sets are you using? Like, from, from where did you get? Like, uh, from, uh, now we, we use our, uh, Samples. We create some samples and we are working on our, our uh, next uh, stage is to, to read the uh, real models of publications. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, you are verifying the uh, cryptography protocols or, or properties or the secrecy properties. And uh, what kind of uh, uh, cryptographic protocols or mechanisms that, that the web application use or uh, are you uh, could, uh, the secrecy properties are preserved or not? And how, how do you uh, define it, formalize the, your uh, model tracker? Uh, I'm not sure what your question is. Uh, uh, but but, but the location is using some kind of uh, cryptographic protocols? Yes. No, we didn't finish that one, no. We are just using uh, some uh, very simple uh, modeling for application, no. Uh, we, we, at the first stage, we, uh, we modeled the SSL protocol as at the start of the web application, but just to uh, start of the session, but just to check the timing, that was all much. Uh, um, any other question? Um, so I'll just, I have one more question, final question. So spin, um, usually, so spin, the model used in spin is, is finite cookie structure, right? Finite, finite yes. model, right? So how do you model the clocks here because um, in a in a faithful or precise way because you said you, you model the clock right you model the so how, how do you do that well like i said that we out of the clocks because of that of the, of the clocks but we okay. we try to uh, de uh, decrease the uh, the what for the time bonding the, we don't put out of what for it, uh, don't increase the timing so we just shift for to the whole one session and that's all so. okay right. Okay. There's no other question. Uh, let's thank uh, Homer again.
Dr. Cooper is our next speaker on uniform interpolation. Which was which of these is working? The right one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm Henry Kuhlmann. Um, I work at the University of Manchester doing a PhD and that's where we should open up with. And my talk is about uniform interpolation of ALC ontology using fixed points. First of all, what is uniform interpolation? So the basic idea is quite simple. You have an ontology which is a terminological terminological uh, knowledge base dealing with concepts and roles, and you want to restrict the concepts that are used in this ontology in such a way that all the consequences, everything that can derive from the ontology dealing with these concepts, uh, is preserved. So imagine you have an ontology with loads of different concepts dealing with the letters. If you compute the uniform component for these three concepts A, I, and G, what you want is that everything that follows from the first ontology uh, with respect to these concepts is still a logical consequence uh, of the uniform interpolant. Um, just a few notes, there are several uh, notions of uniform interpolation. Usually, you would also speak about defining roles um, that are allowed, uh, this allowed in the uniform interpolant. Here, I'm going to concentrate on concepts. And the kind of consequences you want to preserve are of this form uh, subsumptions between arbitrary uh, concept expressions that are uh, in the set of concepts. So why do you want to do this? What are implications of this? So there are actually several cases where uh, uniform interpolation methods could be quite useful. Um, first one is, imagine you have a very general ontology dealing with a huge topic and you want to restrict it for more specific applications. Say, for example, medicine ontology, and you want to create an ontology for dentists, containing only dentistry concepts, and concepts that a dentist understands. Then you could use a uniform interpolation to specify the terms and the concepts that the dentist knows that restricted. You could also do it instead of creating a more specialized ontology, you could also generalize the ontology by giving the general terms of the domain like some very generic medical terms to create a summary of the ontology, give you an overview what the ontology is actually containing without using too much detailed concepts you may not know. Other application very different is um, you have a company, you have a huge knowledge base, you want to publish part of it, other parts are confidential knowledge, you don't want to share them with others, so uh, you would like to remove this information without causing any damage uh, to the rest of it. And the last case, and this is here, is simply refactoring. You have outdated concepts or concepts for some reason you don't want to keep. So far, there's no nice method to remove these without causing any harm. So uh, I'm concentrating on description logic ALC. So description logics are usually used to model these ontologies. And for this uh, description logic, there are already methods that can compute uniform interpolants. The problem is, uh, gen general of the problem is, the output might not always be finitely representable. Give a very simple example. So, imagine uh, we have a very simple ontology with two axioms. The first states every A individual is also B individual, every B individual is related to another B individual. If you want to preserve all consequences over the concept A and the roles, um, you would have to create an infinitely long axiom because of the cycle of B. Every successor has another successor and so on and so on. So as a simple solution, use fixed point operators in the result to express these things in a finite way. So now to the preliminaries. So what is actually the description logic ALC? So basically an ontology consists of axioms that are either uh, Assumption axioms or coherence axioms. Uh, C and D are complex concept descriptions that are of any of these form. So basically, you have disjunction, conjunction, and negation, and then you can make statements about successors for row R, saying that there is at least one R successor which satisfies this concept, or that every R successor, successor satisfies the concept. And 
For the interponent, we had a new construct, the fixed point operator, uh, which is of this form. And here you actually have a concept variable x that occurs in the concept description just as an atomic concept symbol. And express uh, that you have the greatest fixed point over this expression and uh, this variable. So using this, the semantics is quite complicated, so I'm not going too much into detail here. For example, um, the opponent for our last example could be represented in this form using the fixed fixed points. Okay, so now let's come to uniform interpolation, how I'm going to perform it. First, if the ontology has a very nice form, uniform interpolation can be quite in a very easy way. So assume we have exactly one axiom of this form in the ontology, A is the concept you want to remove. And this axiom actually is a subsumption saying every A satisfies this concept description. And if on top of this, A only occurs positively in the rest of the ontology, um, then there's a very simple way. Uh, originally, uh, we require that A is not occurring in this description C. So we have this asymptotic definition that you can simply use by replacing A in the rest of the ontology by what is defined. So, simple example, here we have exactly an axiom like this. Every A is defined as this description. Uh, here the rest is quite small. And what we do is we replace every occurrence of A by this. We get the input. So this case is quite simple and quite intuitive why it works. And the same if we actually have a um, cyclic, cyclic definition. So A occurs positively in C. Then we use a fixed point operator and replace A by the fixed point variable. So same example, now with the cycle on A. So replace every experiment of A by this statement, transformed to a fixed point on A. The problem is, usually, the world is not that simple. Uh, we cannot always create um, these definitions. So uh, in this example, there's no way in actually creating a definition of A, because A is nested in another form, and we cannot pull it out. And uh, still, there's a uniform component uh, that is somehow taking into, into account the interactions between um, formally occurring under our restrictions. So how do we deal with this? So um, the way we implement it is, is having a two-step approach. By the first step, we use a certain calculus that computes all inferences we can perform using A, therefore making A superfluous so we can remove it afterwards. And this calculus deals with these interactions I've shown. Uh, but what the calculus also does is introduce new concepts. So it's not only removing concepts, it's giving us new concepts. But these new concepts all have um, the nice feature that they can be eliminated in a uniform way by simply applying uh, Ackermann's or generalized Ackermann's demo. We always have the definition. So how does this calculus work? So as often we have a kind of normal form which is very related to the CNF normal form used for example in solution. So we require that the ontology uh, only consists of accents of this form, where this is the sign of literals, and this part we may omit. And every literal is either a constant name, a gate constant name, a role restriction with one atomic concept here, or a universal role restriction with one atomic concept here. Whereas E, it's a specific set of concept names that were introduced by the transformation that we would call the final symbols. This is just classical structural transformation uh, as often applied. So these definers come with a definition um, that defines them as having the content that would have occurred here in the original function. So now how does calculus work? So I have two rules. The first rule uh, might look quite familiar to you. It's basically the classical resolution rule with some restrictions. So resolution, we resolve from the symbol we want to forget. A is from now on the symbol we remove. And the main difference, classical resolution here, is that we have the second requirement that uh, in the resolvement, these newly introduced symbols, um, D, that we only have one of them maximally. So they seem like a strong restriction, 
And what we want to have is actually to be able to back down them at the end. And by combining two different definitions, we would uh, generate formulae that are not uh, helpful here. So, okay, but usually we have these occurring in different formulae. How do we make inferences if they're necessary? This is what the second rule is for, which is a bit more unusual. This one is actually uh, they are propagated information of universally quantified um, literals into other role restrictions. So here Q can just be any quantified existential or universal. And what we are doing, we are combining two definers, two formulae, because for a normal form, we cannot have any complex formula here, which is why we dynamically introduce a new definer together with new axioms that represents the conjunction uh, of the content of the one and the two. And we only introduce these when they're actually needed in order to avoid infinite derivations. And um, this is just the same restriction as before. And we further require that we don't combine all kinds of definers, but only the definers that make sense that allow us to do any new inferences on A. Just for optimization. So this is basically the calculus. So we use this calculus um, to get to derive all inferences on A, so that we can remove all information that's related to A. But we are also introducing the definers. But these definers can all be eliminated using Ackermann's lemma. Uh, so we compute the uniform interval. And that's basically it. So here we come to the results. So um, presented the method to compute uniform interpolants for ALC ontologies. Uh, we've proven that it's actually sound, so the derived interpolants preserve all the consequences we're interested in. It always terminates with a finite result using fixed points, uh, which in the worst case is of complexity, of double exponential complexity. Uh, it's already been proven that without using fixed points, the worst case complexity is triple exponential. But uh, experiments so far show that usually there is no explosion. It does not happen in real cases. And what we still want to optimize, though, is the use of fixed points. We see that there are fixed points introduced in a lot of cases where they are not strictly necessary to represent the result in a final way. That's it. Thank you very much. With respect to the fixed points, you said the largest fixed point. Yeah. Does it make a difference whether you take the largest or smallest, or is that just that you oh, uh, have a unique way how you define it? Well, usually, uh, could it be any? So usually, in ALC view, you have both um, greatest fixed point operator and least fixed point operator. But um, well, the way I apply Ackermann's lemma in this case, I only need one of them. That's the main reason. Right. You, you want so it's just that it is one of them. That that's it's clear yeah. which one is meant. Would yeah. really I only need point. one of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I only need the greatest fixed point. But you could as well take the, the least fixed point. Or... No, that would yeah, right. not work in this case. But it's just the it's definers right. I introduce are just of the form that I can apply. Then I only need the greatest fixed point operator. I could do it the other way around as well. Okay. Yeah. Is this the Ackerman who was around long before description of the Yes, 30s. That's quite old. Yes. So I transferred it here to the description logic syntax, and it was generalized in the 90s to the fixed point case. So Ackermann, the Ackermann lemma is quite old. I think it's yeah. 35 was published. What, what does it say in the original? In the original, uh, basically the difference is that, uh, well, it's, you have an implication here, and A mm -hmm. is. A, Oh, that's a generalized version. <laughs> so instead of the subsumption, you have an implication. These are um, second order logic statements. And A is a variable uh, that is predicate that is quantified over. Yes. Ackermann states the equivalence. So and then you will have a REST formula instead of a REST ontology. And what he states is you can replace this variable um, by this complex formula and the rest of the formula. And then you get an equivalent 
A formula. Okay. There was a lot of formula in one sentence. I hope it doesn't confuse. <laughs> so this is usually from the context of second order quantified abbreviation. So. Right, thank you very much. C 
and here we express that it is in R relation with S. So, what can go wrong? Uh, we may go on and expand our tree forever in some cases. So we may not have termination. We may have cycle in top of derivation. We may do some expansion for an individual and we repeat it again and again. So, what should we do? We should detect the cycles and avoid repetition. And how we do that? We do this by stop expansion for individual whose expansion is potentially repetitive. That is what we call blocking. Uh, there are various blocking mechanisms right now. Uh, there exists but a group of blocking mechanisms which we call them standard blocking mechanisms. They are depend on logic. Uh, for, for example, subset ancestor blocking or dynamic equality blocking uh, are being categorized as standard blocking mechanism. You may have heard of them. And there is another blocking mechanism that we use, uh, which is unrestricted blocking mechanism, which is a generic one. Uh, so what's happening in a standard blocking mechanism? Uh, there, you have some condition that if some individual match the condition, you are going to label them as blocked, and you will stop expanding them. So if you uh, remember the, uh, the example I showed you to show the repetition, here it's again, if we take, for example, subset blocking, uh, where it says for individual uh, AI plus J, it's going to be blocked if its label set is a subset of some other individual AI. If we take that example, when we are going to expand AI plus one, it's going to be block, uh, labeled as block since the label set here is a subset of what we have already seen for AI. Uh, and I forgot to say these figures uh, are stand for formula. Uh, the problem for this blocking, uh, this series of this group of blocking mechanisms is that they do depend on logic and they are not always sound. They are, they, you cannot take them from some tablet procedure and use them somewhere else without doing anything. You should go through all the proofs, uh, proofs again. I'm not sure that I understood the, the usage of the word sound. Okay. And you block something, you would not get in, uh, you, you, your calculus would not get unsound. Or what, what do you mean by yeah. sound? Yeah. So, uh, it make you, if, if you got, if for, take for example some description logic which got inverse rule in it, okay? If you use uh, subset blocking, you may block two individual, and as a consequence of that block, those two are kind of going to be merged. And you may get unsatisfiable while the given input is satisfiable. This can happen. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, there is another blocking mechanism which, which is an unrestricted blocking mechanism. It's a generic blocking mechanism. It's based on a simple rule. You can see it here. On the premise, what we got on the premise, it is a stand for find two individuals that do exist in this branch. So some individual belong to its own singleton. Uh, what's happening? We are going to have two branches in the conclusion, where in the left branch, we are going to merge those two individuals by rewriting. And on the right one, you are going to explicitly mention that they cannot be the same, they cannot be equal. We actually use order rewriting for the sake of efficiency. Blocking actually happening on the left branch, and we are going to discover, I don't know, uncover from unsuccessful blocking when we get a clash. So when we go to this branch, T is actually blocked by S, and we continue until we get a contradiction and we can backtrack. This rule, in order to get termination of it, should be applied exhaustively before any application of generating rules. For example, if you take Shoy, it should be applied exhaustively before any application of this. So taking those kind of graph again, uh, on the right branch, we just explicitly mentioned that AI is not 
equal to AI plus one. On the left one, uh, AI is going to be equal to AI plus one, and we are going to merge them. So whatever they got as label set, it's going to be merged. There are loads of benefit in using this blocking mechanism. It's uh, since it's based on a sound rule, uh, it can be incorporated into any sound and complete tableau causally, and you don't need to prove everything again. Uh, it does kind of guarantee termination for logic with finite model property, and it does not require any uh, specialized tests, and it is intuitively simple. But there is a problem. It can create potentially many unnecessary branching points, especially when you got a large number of individuals, or you will eventually have a large number of individuals in the tableau, or when you are checking some uh, unsatisfiable inputs. So, what should we do? We are going to reduce the search space by controlling this blocking rule. Uh, what do we mean by controlling the blocking rule? We mean controlling the application of the blocking rule by imposing some additional sign condition to this. So, it's not going to be applicable to any pair of individuals that we got on the branch anymore. Uh, we can come up with various criteria for this control. For example, we can only apply the blocking to some individuals that appear from some point and onward in the derivation, or we can go and check uh, the existing blocking mechanism and use their uh, conditions. For example, take this one. Uh, as an example of just blocking individual from some point on one in the derivation, we can avoid apply blocking to the individuals we had in A box. So we had individuals we had at the beginning. Uh, this variation is going to be, we are going to call it U, we know A box. It's going to apply to two individuals, two individuals where at least one of them is not from A box. So at least one of them should be some individual that we have created during derivation. There are various examples that this can be useful, and they do actually do this in description logic most of the time, because normally when they have nominals, they are assumed to be distinct. Or take, for example, in real case, real world example, you may have some ontologies that uh, contain uh, people and some information about them, and those people are mentioned by their national ID. You won't, you don't want to merge two people together. Uh, so that's where this rule can be useful. Using this rule, uh, instead of the original one that I introduced, can have significant impact on the performance when you have reasoning with the knowledge base which contain a large number of individuals. So as uh, another example, is when we have unique name assumption. And I don't mean we have unique name assumption for all the individuals. There are cases that there are subsets of individuals in the input that you have unique name assumption on them. For example, take the case that you have an input that you have individuals both for classes, I mean courses, and students. Uh, Individuals in the set of classes are distinct between themselves, and students are also distinct. So, using this rule, we are not going to merge any two classes together or any two students together. Taking this to general case, we may pick any finite set of individuals and having, the, uh, having them priori to the derivation, we can use this rule which I uh, denoted by U we know S, where we are not blocking any pair of individuals selected from the set S. For example, for the A box uh, example I showed you, S is equal to A box individual. With regard to termination, this, this U we know S rule is going to behave exactly the same as uh, the original one I introduced. Let's uh, tap be the ta uh, tableau calculus. Let's tap be sum and complete tableau calculus for some logic L. 
uh, tab plus UVRW denotes that family calculus where we have added the unrestricted blocking group to that. And tab UV no S is that type of calculus where we have added UV no S to that. If tab UV RW is terminating, then we can for sure say that tab UV no S is also somewhat complete and terminating for that logic. Termination for the two cases I've showed you follows from this. So we may only finitely many blocking rule applications. We are currently running some experiment, it's not complete yet. Uh, but, and actually the main purpose of that was something else, but we are also testing this variant of blocking and we are running uh, on more than 4,000 inputs and what we are seeing is that the rule application is much lower for some of this variant of uh, unrestricted blocking. For future, we are we hope that we can introduce other specialized variant of the blocking rule uh, and we are going to investigate termination for them. Uh, doing this, we do hope to get greater insight into theory and technique of different uh, blocking mechanisms and their implementation. And we do want to introduce a framework, a general framework for blocking mechanisms which is based on unrestricted blocking mechanism and which provides a uniform way for explaining and impl implementation of blocking mechanism in Tableau Prover. Having all this information, then we will be able to express the relation between logic and the minimal criteria you need for them, the minimal criteria uh, for blocking you need for them. So our vision is to make the development of Tableau Prover systematic and automatic. We have Tableau Synthesis Framework, where you can synthesize, sum, and complete Tableau calculate from specification of logic. We will have, hopefully, blocking mechanism framework, which is going to automatically suggest the best candidate blocking mechanism, which you can get termination with. And we will have a system which is going to generate the prover for you automatically and also provide you the code so you can go on and edit it and optimize it and do whatever you want to do with it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.